Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 209 for Tuesday, April 30th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. This episode is sponsored by Banzoogle. We're at banzoogle.com with promo code GIGGAB. You get 15% off your first year. We'll talk more about why all that matters and how all that matters in a little bit. For now, here, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you, Mr. Kent? Doing pretty well, Mr. Hamilton. What's going on? Uh, you know, I had actually had some travel this weekend. I had a, a, an interesting week because last week I played, uh, rehearsed and then played Madhouse on uh, Wednesday night. And then first thing Thursday morning, got on an airplane and, and flew to Chicago with my family to look at some schools for my son. Nice. Yeah, the mad the Madhouse gig was was good. it was actually really good. It went far better than I thought. Uh, it was weird because normally we do rehearsal the day before, you know, on Tuesday and then play the gig on Wednesday. So it's all very fresh uh, with this one because of scheduling in the theater and then personal scheduling of, you know, various people involved. We had to rehearse Sunday night and then we had Monday off and Tuesday off and I packed and I had a lot of work and, you know, like this gig left my brain. And I know the same thing happened to everybody else. And then Wednesday came and we ran some things on Wednesday afternoon um, but, uh, and then had the gig Wednesday night, but everybody, I think was aware that we had this longer than usual gap and, and took a little bit of extra time to sort of be prescient and uh, 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 cognizant of, of this. And, and it, it actually worked out really well. We, um, the nicest part for me was that a lot of times in Madhouse, there are a lot of things that are tracked, like a lot of songs that are tracked and, or, the underscoring. So there's some dialogue and stuff. And a lot of times the underscoring will just be like sound effects tracked. And this one was called Madhouse Noir. And so the idea was that a lot of it was, had this like, you know, 1920s feel or whatever. And the uh, director was like, well, you know, could the band play the underscoring? And it worked out great. We actually didn't put together the underscoring music until maybe 45 minutes before curtain, which gave us 20 minutes to do it so we could clear the house and they could seat people. But we came up with three songs to play and it was one, two or three. We came up with the, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, you know, what key it would be in and kind of the groove. And so when time came for underscoring, we'd call one, two or three and sort of paste them out. But the nice part was we got to play all the way through the show which is a really nice thing for, you know, us cover band musicians. We it's easy to take for granted all of the benefits that come with not taking a, like not stopping in the middle of a set uh, and staying warm and staying loose and all of that stuff where as uh, like theater gigs and sometimes madhouse gigs, depending on the pacing, you know, there's often you play for whatever, three minutes, four minutes, and then you don't play for another five minutes and this constant hot, cold, hot, cold thing can really impact your playing or it certainly impacts mine. Whereas, you know, on a, like a cover gig, you know, you, you might take a, a breath between between tunes every now and then. But for the most part, if you're on stage, you're on stage and you're playing and you can kind of get your heart rate up and stay warm throughout. And we were able to do that for Madhouse, which was actually really quite a treat. And I think is part of why things worked as as well as they did. So, yeah, it was it was, it was fun. Cool. It was a, it was an interesting set list. You know, we came off that Queen one that we had just finished. And right. So, the, you know, this was like I came in thinking there's just like it's going to be a letdown. Like there's just no way it's going to be that good. That was like the best Madhouse we've ever done. And it wasn't quite that spectacular and exciting. But the Madhouse players have kind of found their groove, right? I mean, they, there's enough familiarity and there's enough, you know, positive anticipation that those things are, you know, Everybody has got a similar energy level to making those things work no matter what they throw at you, right? It, it's true. And and the crowd, we have a, you know, we have a, a crowd, right? We have a following for Madhouse. Mm. And, and so, yeah, it's crazy that once a month on a Wednesday night, we can put, you know, 200 to 250 people in a theater. 
uh, which is fantastic, it, you know, and, and these people are totally awesome. into it. And that, of course, feeds us on stage as well. But we had two people in the band that were doing their first Madhouse. Our keyboard player was uh, someone he had he had I'd played with him before. He he did a couple of the shows of Hedwig with us and uh, and and but, you know, still new keyboard player. And our we had a trumpet player who had never done a Madhouse before either. And it's a different thing, you know, especially for people that are coming from like the theater world. It's like, yeah, forget everything, you know, about like fading into the woodwork. The band is part of the show. Like you are on stage and it's okay. And you can talk to the actors and the actors aren't they aren't actors. They're singers. Right. They are your lead singer for this song. And the next song might be a different lead singer. But like interaction is okay and also encouraged. Right. Yeah. So, but it was great. Like everybody, you know, everybody communicated, everybody, uh, we locked in and we did some fun. I mean, there were some fun tunes. Uh, a lot of the jazz stuff that we did was cool. We played a bunch of Louis Prima tunes and which meant like, you know, we played, I want to be like you, which is a fun mm-hmm. one. And, um, but we did like stairway to heaven and, and Cindy Lauper's time after time and things like that too. So it was, yeah, it was all over the place. Like Matt. That's cool. Yeah, it was fun. I had a gig on, uh, on Saturday night. It was a corporate gig. And it was smaller than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like three, four, five hundred people. And it was about 125 people. So it was kind of smaller, more intimate. The first thing I want to share about that show was it was in a, a marble and glass rotunda that went up about five stories high. We're on the first floor. So how was the sound? Well, that's, that's it. <laughs> okay. right? So poor Bill is still in therapy over this thing. Yeah. But, um, but here's the happy ending to the story. Bill implored everybody, you got to turn down. Oh, right. And everybody stepped up. And, you know, so the stage volume was extremely manageable, very manageable. Sound was good right in front of the speakers, you know, kind of mm-hmm. where they were. But, yeah, it did get a little bit weird. And there was some bounce back and stuff like that. But my band, I'm happy to report, definitely stepped up big time, recognized what a train wreck would be if, uh, if we didn't show some restraint volume wise. That's let great. He'll do his thing. Yeah, yeah. He did a great job. So that was cool. That's it good was because that's a people. like like we like we've said before, right? That like you don't want to back into playing at a low volume. You want to start there, and right. and that kind of that fear of oh my god, this room, like the reflection, uh oh, like that can that can actually that can be a good thing, and it sounds like it was. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it worked out great. And it was one of those things where there's a lesson that. You know, corporate gigs are weird. We think we're the greatest thing since sliced bread and people can't wait to dance to us. But they were still serving food, you know, and dessert when we first started. And, you know, you really have to have a certain amount of patience to make these gigs go well. You just do your thing. Don't overstick it. You know, just plow ahead. And eventually food will be done. The alcohol will have taken its place and people will look to have a good time. And so we had, you know, out of 120 people, we might have had. 15 to 20 dancing consistently, occasionally, you know, a song here or there, it was more, but they had a really good time and, and uh, you know, everyone's tapping their toes and you kind of learn to read the audience that way. Yes. Dancing is not always the only litmus test, especially, you know, when people are in tuxes and people are there for business reasons to talk and network and those types of things. And, well, it's, and especially know, if the band is, is the last thing on the schedule, right? I mean, people are exactly. usually worn out by that point. I mean, they yeah. might've been there for f- three hours or something. So, yep. This one was a little better. I think we've talked about ones where there are auctions and games and all that type of stuff. And they literally are there three or four hours by the time we start. I got one this of those one coming just, up on Saturday. It's yep. It's how it goes. Yeah, they have, ban- they have, they have the band scheduled to play for two hours two maybe two hours and 15 minutes. The same was true last year. We played 45 minutes. Yep. <laughs> Yep. It's just how it goes. Yep. yep. Just part of the deal. And and the thing is we get so excited and get our energy up to really, you know, like kill it in the room. And, you know, those first couple, when you realize the vibe isn't set up, it's not about you, you know, pro bands will just plow through and deliver, smile, entertain, play. You know, I know when we first started getting these, it would be so disheartening and be like, why are we doing this? Oh, it's a good payday. That That's right. Yep. And you just got to kind of, you know, it's just part of the deal. It's just part of the deal. But you you said it, right? You you have to accept that 
it's not about you. Like this isn't a house rockers show that people came for. It's whatever the event is. And the house rockers are playing at this event. Like, but yeah. that it, it, and and once you, I, I really think it takes some experience. Like it, it, we can say it and accept it like logically, but you, I think like you said, you have to go through it and experience like, Oh, right. That's what this means. Okay, and then the next time you're like, okay, I know this coming in. Like, I know going Saturday, I'm well, looking like, forward to hanging out with the band. I'm looking forward to playing, but I know that there at times are going to be 10 people on the dance floor and that's okay. You know? Right. Just how it is. Yep. And, and you know, it's not terribly unlike that litmus test when you play a club date and there's only a handful of people in the, in the room. Do you plow ahead and give the best show you can? Or do you like, oh, this sucks and, you know, uh, lay back a little bit. And that's where the semi-pro to professional vibe kind of transcends yep the person who is like i play music because it's who i am i'm going to do it right and to my expectations regardless of the scenario around me that's right i think i think that's one of those you know I, and again when you're a semi-pro maybe you're not playing all the time and you get excited you got a good paying gig you're really excited it, it just takes a while for you to understand that not people not dancing is not a commentary on the quality of what you're offering them necessarily it's like, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, it could, yeah, it could yeah. be, but I just think it's, and uh, I was walking out, I, I drove home with uh, my sax player who, you know, has been doing these for a long time. And he said, yeah, you know, it's just the thing, you know, I see it all the time, no matter how great the band is, you know, the vibe of the event, dancing, you know, is an, is a nice to have for some people who like to dance at the end of the event. And you got to just kind of do your thing. And, you know, it's a good experience, I think, for a band to get good at that. Like, well, and it's easy. I, I honestly think it's easier to swallow that scenario at a corporate gig than a club gig for the reason that like a club gig in theory, it is you that's the draw, right? Whereas at the corporate gig, you can immediately write it off. Like you said, this has nothing to do with us. And but you still want to go play your best. And it's like, oh, well, I'm hired. And you still want to go best. over. Yes. Right. You want to go over and but you got to kind of make your line a little bit softer. You're going to go over with some core people who are excited. They are celebrating. They're having a good time. But, you know, the, the guys who are there to network. That's what they're going to do. And, and don't want to be bad dancers in front of their boss or their customer or something like that. They're not going to get on the dance floor. Right? It's not going to happen. They're going to hang at the bar and they're going to, you know, do what they're there for. So, yeah. You know, you do the best you can and um, the feedback, you know, people like the band and they, they enjoy the performance. And we, we were a thorough professional group on Saturday night and it was, you know, volume wise, performance wise, playing wise, you know, it was, it was a good, good experience. In, in general, was everyone in the band like, like happy at the end of the night? I mean, understanding yeah. the scenario and it was like, oh, that's good. Like we succeeded. Like was, was there that vibe amongst I, the band? I'd say so. That's I, great. I think we've done enough of them now yeah. where- where that anticipation that, well, you haven't seen my fastball, you know, it's not like, it's like when we take the stage, everyone's going to drop everything and pay attention to us, you know, not and, necessarily. And, that's right. Yeah. Not yep. necessarily, you know, it's not, it's, it's, that's not the point of it. Right. We're, we're, we're part of the proceedings, not, not the center of the proceedings. That's right. Yes. You're part of them. Not, not the center. That's a great way of looking at it. Those casino gigs taught me that, you know, mm. it, like, and, and there it was weird because a lot of times, as soon as we st- we would play 40 minute sets, it was 40 on 20 off, like religiously, not yes, 41. Told me about this. Right. Yeah. And it was clear that like there's other things that are going to happen around you. And those are timed. And so are you because of that. I've never played a casino gig. What, what was the expectation from the guy who hired you that you stick to the schedule and yeah. he's not worried about whether people are dancing and or, you know, he, he knew you were, could play or you wouldn't have gotten the gig in the first place. But the most important thing is sticking to the schedule. The and, most there know. were. Yeah. So they assumed we could play because we had a picture with us in suits. That really <laughs> honestly was the reason we got those gigs. I don't know if that would That's still funny. be true today, but that was definitely it. No question. Right. And we were, you know, we were like a, uh, we were playing Beatles and Stone stuff. So that's why we had the suits. We wore suits and clubs too. It wasn't like we only wore them for Foxwoods, but, right. um, but that's why we got the gig. The most important thing was that we didn't play too loud. Like mm-hmm. without question, that was the most important thing. Then as long as we, you know, played relatively well, everything else was fine. Of course, still wearing the suits like that's good because it's the right look that the casino wanted. They wanted people right. that, you know, that, yeah, had a look. Um, 
but uh, but, but yeah, they want people gambling, right? You are a you are a service when people want to take a break Correct. from gambling. But if you were too successful, probably would have worked against you, right? Yeah, the first time we played there, we had uh, it like what for whatever reason. This area where we played was sort of in the middle of the casino, just like re- truly in the middle of the floor. Like we were raised up maybe five feet, like the bar was raised up five feet. Then we were, you know, another three feet up uh, uh, off that from the on the stage. And uh, and the first time we played there, we played three nights. I think it was the you know, one set, the second night or something. Second set, maybe we played four sets. So it was, you know, 40 on 20 off times four. And uh, it was like the end of the second or third set, for whatever reason, it was the right time of night. We were playing the right tunes, whatever. Like there must have been 2000 people like just packed around, like in this bar was completely packed to the gills. And then around it was packed to the gills. And like the crowd just roared at the end of every song. It was fantastic. Mm. But we also were aware of the fact that like, okay, we should enjoy this, but this might screw us. Like we might not get invited back because right. you know, they ain't we, gambling because they ain't gambling. That's right. But it was important. Like when we ended that particular block of 40 minutes, people were like more, more encore. And it was like this huge thing. And, and the sound guy looked at us and it was clear. We already knew, don't do it. but yeah. he was like, mm-hmm, don't, don't do. even <laughs> like you, you shan't, you know, you shall not. Shant. Yes. And it was like, yeah, no, 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 we know we're good. We're good. He's like, yeah, that's that. They said that doesn't always happen. And they were cool with it. But like, while we were on stage, we had this simultaneous, like thorough pleasure and joy. Uh, but also fear. What like, band was this? This was the um, what did we call ourselves at that point in time? It was the responders. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the black suits, white shirts, skinny black tie, skinny black ties, playing Beatles and Stones and some Motown and but also some Tom Petty and, you know, things like that. Just like, you, you know, yeah. Those, classic rock. Yeah. Classic rock. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it was a good band. I mean, it, you know, we we definitely deserve the applause and everything, but it was this weird thing. Like we kept looking at each other, like, "What's going on here? That's not how this place usually is." But, but we'll take it. And it, and the sound guy did say we we got to know him over time because we played there a bunch. And he's like, "Yeah, you know, it it happens. It's just like the right time of night. Maybe people came out of a comedy show and mm-hmm. they're amped, but they're not worn out by music, and they want to like, you know, whatever." He's like, "It's just like it's." He's like, "Sometimes it happens." Like stars oh, line up. This stars line up, and he's like, "We're not. We don't worry about it." I'm like, okay, mm. whew, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, so we got an interesting email. Someone kind of challenging my position on on uh, the use of iPads, and we did. Uh, and we're going to talk about it, but first, we're going to talk about our sponsor. Can I do that? Excellent. Okay, Excellent. sweet. Yeah, because this is this is an interesting conversation to have for sure. So, um, but I do want to talk about Banzoogle, which is our. For sponsor here at Banzoogle.com, where, as I mentioned in the intro of the show, promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B, gets you 15% off your first year there. Banzoogle is where you go. And when I say you, I mean you in general, our listeners, but also you, Paul, you, you not only go there, you went there and created your website. This is how musicians do it, right? It's built by musicians for musicians. It's an all-in-one platform that makes it super easy to build a website for your music. And Banzoogle powers these websites for tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from folks like us, weekend warriors, to Grammy winners. And sometimes they have to look in their database and say, oh yeah, look at that. That's like, that's that's who we thought it was. Holy cow. Like they just signed up and used Banzoogle just like you or I could. So if you ever wanted to do something that uh, made you feel like a Grammy winner, go sign up <laughs> for a Banzoogle website because this is what Grammy winners do. Right. And uh, it, it because it's got all the features that you need built in Banzoogle hosts your website. You can do it with a custom domain name if you want, which is what Paul's doing with svhouserockers.com. Dozens of fully customizable design templates so you don't have to create something out of scratch. They give you a platform and a foundation that you can then tweak to your heart's content. Banzoogle's got all the tools you need to sell your music and your merch commission free. They've got what? Yep. They've got mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, social media integration and live support seven days a week. Live support seven days a week. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Because, you know, sometimes you're working 
on a Saturday or Sunday because that's sometimes when we musicians work. So you got to check this out. Do like Paul did, do like Grammy winners have done, and go to bandzoogle.com. Try it for free for 30 days, right? No, you, you got no commitment. You 30 days, plenty of time to really get in there and sort it out, learn how great it is. And then, because you're going to be ready to sign up, make sure you use coupon code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B. Actually, they call it promo code, but promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B. That gets you 15% off your first year. Our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. Great, great, great service. We've been so happy with it. When they say built by musicians for musicians, absolutely. The themes are just gorgeous. Puts a polish and a professionalism on your brand, on your band, that uh, it's just so easy to, to obtain. So highly recommend it. I Sweet. use it myself. I know. It's like it's like you're a Grammy winner already. <laughs> maybe you are. Maybe, uh, maybe there's something I don't know about you, Paul. I don't know. All right, so let me uh, let me pull up Dan's email here and uh, and let's read what Dan had to say because this gets gets very interesting. He said uh, you had to know that you were opening the floodgates on this one when you talked about iPads on stage, right? He says, "Okay, here goes. My band, the Clanky Lincolns, is known for our crowd engagement and connection. It's one of the things we get big feedback for literally every show and." We've used iPads since the beginning. He says, I think it's easy to have iPads be a distraction. And I'm not defending performers who allow their iPad to take over their show. That's obviously no good. However, I think it's not accurate to say that iPads or other memory aids are necessarily detrimental to performance. The ability to use it as a memory aid rather than a focus of attention is a skill to develop just like any other. You have to train yourself to stay present rather than getting sucked down into the screen. Consider that since neither of you have put in that work, which is fine, he says, why would you have? You're unaware that it's possible to use them that way. Pictures of huge A-list performers taken from upstage often reveal them to be using floor-based teleprompters. You'd never tell Mick Jagger to quit using that crutch, would you? What crutch? He's obviously done the work and practice necessary to let it just be there as an unobtrusive guide when he needs it. And for the most part, you'd never know it exists. He says, I'm with Mick. Taking my fallible human memory out of the equation is the professional thing to do. It frees up my mental energy to focus on my performance and the audience. It also makes it a whole lot easier to onboard new material, helping me constantly keep my show fresh for my audience. He says, for me, the pluses far outweigh the minuses, and I really don't care how it looks. Civilian audiences don't notice or care. I'm engaging them. Their eyes are on me. I've never had a single person, person mention it or ask or anything. He says, and those guys in bands that stand in the back with their arms crossed should spend more time working to improve their own bands and uh. less time judging mine. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Yeah. You know what? Dan's totally right. And it's a good perspective to have. This can be a learned skill. And I've actually found I'm getting better with it, especially like with these madhouses where it would be impossible not to uh, not to have uh, an iPad or charts of some sort on stage, given the amount of prep time we have. And fascinatingly, perhaps, you know, synchronously, synchronicity struck here. I noticed the other night at Madhouse that I was engaged in watching the performance far more than I have been in the past. And, it, and I certainly had my iPad there, but it was like, oh, yeah, you know, like I know where we are in the tune. I can glance at it occasionally, see where, you know, what the next thing is. And I think I only missed like one thing or whatever being sort of, you know, detached from my iPad and it wasn't a train wreck. It was like, oh, yeah, there was a stop there. OK, well, whatever. You know, show the show went on without it. So it was fine. No problem. But uh, but he's right. You know, it is. There is a skill here. Um, so that's it's interesting perspective. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, first of all, that's a really cool email. And, you know, I don't I don't uh, I don't think either of us are are judging or coming off as though our opinion is the only one that matters. I mean, whatever it is in life, you got to make it work for you. Sure. I don't have any immediate examples in my mind of uh, performers around here where it's invisible when they're using it. So my, my sample size is telling me, you know, that it is used more as a crutch and it is distracting, but you know, if a guy is having success, the success speaks for itself. That's right. The audience is reacting and, you know, they don't mind. They're, you know, it's a little bit different having a nice, clean, huge stage and having a teleprompter in front. Bruce uses a teleprompter as well. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, of course. I, I get it. Um, 
you know, and, it, and like I said, Nick in our band, it tucks behind his keyboard. It's, it's unobtrusive and he's good at just getting a glance to get the one word for the phrase to get him through the section of the song. You know, my horns, <clears throat> my horns all use um, pads uh, to read music. So they read charts off of them. Sure. Um, you know, here's the thing I can say about that. There are songs we've been playing for 10, 15 years that I'm amazed that they're still reading the charts on. Like it's because they have they, them. Well, that's what I'm saying is that once, you know, that that's part of that skill. Yeah. I would be interested to hear because once you, once you focus on it, your brain knows it's there and doesn't seem to want to let you memorize it. So I had a, that, I just, had that experience when we did Hedwig, um, you know, we did it in December and I didn't know it at all. If, if listeners might remember, I declined that gig about six times, you know, and then a week before they're like, we still need a drummer. You can have your iPad on stage. You don't need to memorize. I'm like, OK, fine. Um, but then we did it again in January. And certainly by the end of the run, even in December, I knew that show cold. I mean, it's just a rock show. Mm. And I still like found myself looking at the iPad and I didn't trust myself to turn it off, even though I certainly could have, you, you know, but it's just one of those things. Like once you have it and once your flow is based on like, I think to Dan's point, you have to practice using it without just reading from it. Like yeah. from you, have to day, to, you have to commit to it being a cheat instead of the focus from day one, like even the first rehearsal, you know, you've got to be working towards being quote unquote off book as much as as much as you, you, you know, as much as you can so that it is just like, oh, a quick little. Yep. OK, got it. Great. That's where I need to go next. No problem. It's a and different mostly what way I was reacting learning. to. Yeah, it is a different way of learning. Mostly what I was reacting to is. um I think Dan's been a listener for a while because I remember the name of his band and I've checked out some videos and they, and they are a very, very entertaining band. So clearly they know their business and they know what they're doing and they, and they are focused on being good at that, which I guess is the ultimate, the ultimate thing you're looking for, right? right. You know, are you entertaining? Right. And if you find a way to, to be so good that those things disappear because the rest of your show is so entertaining to people, well, good for you. And, and again, I don't, I don't claim to have a license on right in, in many of these things. And this is certainly not a hill I would die on, but you know, I know my learning process, you know, I don't know that I would, I don't know that I would go down that hole of, of uh, wanting to perfect the, um, how to use the pad as a, I, I think I would, what I'd rather do is learn my show, me, right? Yeah. I, you yeah. Know, and I, and I would actually rather uh, turn down requests of things that might be in my pad uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, learning my show and saying, here's what I have for you tonight. And, and I'm going to play it through two different styles. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. And, you know, th that's the main thing that Dan's note kind of turns the light bulb on for me. I, I, I know I need to be careful. We have this conversation, Dave, and, 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 uh, it's just two guys just talking about what they think, right? right. Someone asks our opinion, we give our opinion, but certainly <laughs> there's a lot of people being successful in a lot of different ways. I was thinking the other day, like, you know, we have that friend, Steve Witchell, who runs that cover band central, um, yeah. Right. And they have some really cool discussions. Well, actually, let me let me pause that. They have a lot of discussions and you watch the way musicians interact with each other and uh, it can get it can get pretty tense. Right. This is uh, one of those holy wars too. this iPads on stage thing seems to be becoming that thing because totally. it's being talked about quite a bit. So, yeah. you know, just the reminder, you know, let's hey, just ask your question. Ask, ask yourself the same question you ask in any other aspect of your life. How's it working for you? <laughs> How's it working right? for you? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Self-awareness. That's right. Yep. That's right. But good, good email, Dan. Thanks a lot for, you know, reminding us that we are, we are observers of the human condition and cover bands, not, uh, not, uh, not definers of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so along these lines, listener Dave had, uh, had written in and, and essentially asked, he says, you know, what apps do you use on your tablets and how do you go about making this work? Are there apps specifically for like cover? Are there apps that are better suited to, you know, cover band lead sheets versus theater scores? And do you have a way of marking it up? And the answer is to everything. Yes. Um, I, I have found there are two apps that I use in different scenarios. The first is an app called Fourscore, F O R S C O R E dot co is the URL. It's available for the iPad. I don't believe there's an Android version. I've been using this for five years now, 
and it's fantastic. You can take a score in as a PDF um, and you can use individual songs. I actually have been using four score for uh, for a lot of my cover band gigs and for like Madhouse, too. But certainly for a theater show where you have one PDF that is your book uh, and you need to you know flip pages or whatever and make notes on it. It's it's great. You can make notes by drawing. If you have an Apple pencil, you can use it. You can also type notes onto it. I use both. Um, it honestly, I'm, I'm, I have an Apple pencil. I don't use it all that much. I really, I can write like little cheats and stuff, you know, and scratch out rhythms, uh, just with my finger. It's very efficient. And then you can put it into what they call performance mode where all of the buttons stop working. And basically, as long as you don't tap on the very left edge of the screen, anything you do advances the page forward, right? Which is really what you would want to happen during a, during a performance. So, it, and, and you can link it to like Bluetooth pedals and things like that. If you want to use pedals as a drummer, I find, uh, I don't like a third pedal would be worse <laughs> than just tapping it with my finger to, to be perfectly honest. But, um, but obviously if you're, you know, a horn player or whatever, they, I, I know they use pedals and those work great. Um, it, it, I, I've really found four score to be fantastic and you can link multiple iPads together. So if everybody's on the same chart, you can have it so that when one person changes the page, it changes for everyone. I actually, Ooh. I did that one night. It was for Rocky horror. We did the midnight performance of Rocky horror and it had been a while since I had played it. We played it like, you know, for Christmas or something. And our music director, our keyboard player was to my right, which is off like the worst for me because I have my chart to my left. I'm almost always looking like to the left of my kit, the way I'm set up. So he was, almost behind me and if i looked at him i couldn't you know it was like 180 degrees to look at him versus look at my chart and i needed my chart on the left because that's where i'm usually looking and that's also where i can like tap with my left hand to move things along and i thought wait a minute i have a second ipad with me that i was using for the for the mixer to mix my ears i can sync these two up with four score and sure enough it took all of about 30 seconds and i had both ipads one on either side and they were always in sync and so so that's that's one app that I've used. And another one is called on song um, where you can just load PDFs in and on song is actually pretty cool because if you pull in like a smart chart from like um, uh, ultimate guitar, or one of those places, yep. you it can parses it. Yeah. it parses it and, and it will show you chord fingerings either for piano or for guitar. And then if you say, oh, I need to move it down a half step, it, yep. it like it cast. You so saw you use on song too, Paul. Is that right? I use on song and I use an air turn page turner, which is awesome. There Both are go. really good apps, but uh, I don't get as much value out of on song because I have this huge library before I went to on song before I was just using a, like a, a, a note taking app. Sure. And so I have, you know, 2000 charts in PDF and converting them into that text format that that on song can do its magic with. I just have not gotten into that. So but I you just can pull it. PDFs into on song, too, and just have them as the raw PDF. I've, I've That's done, what I do. No, oh, you did that. OK, so you've got what, what I'm saying there. is I use them as PDFs, but got I don't it. get the the value of the on song magic trans That's transposing That's keys and all that type of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, on songs great and air turn is great. As a as a page turner, so simple, just works. It's really you don't have to think very much about it. That's great. That I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've thought about it, but like I said, adding a, another pedal just feels like a disaster waiting to happen oh, for me. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, the only thing about tapping a screen live, you know, like heat and water on fingers, sweat on fingers. I just find tapping anything on the screen during the middle of a performance seems to be difficult. Hmm. I have not run into that. I I I get what you're saying. It. The um, one piece of advice I'll give to anybody, whether you're tapping the screen or using a pedal, is go into your settings on your tablet and turn off the auto uh, screen sleep on your on your thing, because right. nothing's worse than having your screen go black. Yeah. And then if you've got like your fingerprint set, like my fingerprints do not work on stage like because mm. because of sweat. And yeah. so trying to unlock a thing in the middle of a performance. That is a disaster. Waiting to, it's just not going to happen. No, it's not. <laughs> but um, I with, with four score, I've started using four score for all my um, for all my uptown gigs, because every gig, you know, we have like the same group of songs, but they're always in a different order, often in a different order. 
And with Fourscore, I can build set lists and I can tag all of my songs. So like my Madhouse stuff, I tag with Madhouse or, you know, in my Uptown stuff, I tag with Uptown. And then I can On say, song, you can build set lists as well. Can you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I can reorder things and like, yep. it's great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yep. Yeah, it's good stuff. That is, that is good technology if you're going to use that type of stuff. I like, like being I able to edit stuff. Like and making notes mm. on a chart. Can you do that? You That I haven't figured out how to do an on song, but it probably is doable. So I think an on song, I got it again. I I don't use it for much more than a reader. Yep. I think I can put like sticky notes on, on okay. things. And, then, and I think there's some PDF editing um, capabilities yeah. or markup, probably markup. more markup than editing. Markup is a better word. That's right. Yep. 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 Yeah. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I while we're here, I and I, I, I think we're. I know we're we're near the end of of your time today. But I will say, you know, there was you mentioned Cover Band Central. There was a post today where somebody had said, I think it was actually Steve who said, uh, knowing uh, the, the amount of like knowing a lot of songs is the single most important aspect uh, or skill to have as as to to get work as a musician. And in a cover band, I, I think that's probably true. And mm -hmm. certainly the page is called Cover Band Central. So I, with that within that context, I agree with that. However, I will say that perhaps equally as important in the cover band scenario and more important outside of it uh, than knowing songs is knowing how to read. It's read. not wow. it's, it's not mandatory as a cover band musician. But once you're in a band with people who know how to read, being able to have that 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 shorthand as a conversation also just, you know, for yourself, charting things down or finding a chart and being able to just read it down as opposed to yeah. having to like it. It's a hugely valuable skill. Oh, uh, I agree with both those things. I think in, in the cover band world, if you want to if you want to have a cover band, if you want to sub for cover bands, mm. having a huge repertoire ready to go. And, and you know, there are. Rock and roll fake book things. I think you posted. I think you I th saw that you responded. It was a post about the 50, 50 yeah. must know cover band songs, right? Yeah, right? Which is a good list. And, you know, you could probably expand that to 100. And as a sub, you're probably in pretty good shape if that's the life that you want to lead as being a hired gun. But you're right. Once you get outside of that and you're kind of in more, uh, you know, more typical professional musician scenarios, studio work. Um, all these types of things, the ability to read and be fast on your toes, have a good ear, but being being able to read is probably the most useful thing. Yep. Even if you show up and charts aren't there, like I find, and, and again, this is easy for me to say because I know how to read. I, if I have to make my own notes, I will make them using, you know, music notation like I do for the Madhouse stuff. It's like, oh, there's this weird fill. All right. How does it count? You know, how's it counted? Great. Now I don't have to think about it. I can look at this a year from now and it, I will understand what I wrote. You, you know what I mean? Like and yep. that kind of thing. It's super helpful. So if you sure. are on the fence about whether or not to, to learn how to read, I say do it. It's, it's not going to hurt you. And, it, you know, hopefully it'll help. So there you go. Yeah. All right, man. All right. Well, that's what I got. You got anything else, man? No, it's a good one. This I, is a good I like one. those questions. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Thanks. Send them in. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And, uh, hey, Dave. Yeah, Paul. iPad or no iPad, just for the love of God, just always be performing. Yeah, man, you said it. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>